Hi there, my name is John Prescott. I am a photographer with about, uh, photographer and videographer with about 20 years uh, experience in this. And today we are gonna talk about what makes a good, uh, makes a good photograph and of course, uh, how that translates into video. So thank you for uh, you know, taking the time to uh, go through this presentation uh, with me. Hopefully this answers a lot of your questions. And of course, I don't know what your skill set is, so it's gonna be kind of uh, uh, tough to answer the questions, uh, obviously, uh, just because we're not together here, but hopefully this all makes sense. Um, also too, for the video side of things, there is no prerequisite that you need to watch the photography part to do the video part, however, uh, I have absolutely designed this so that uh, the photography part of the uh, this course translates very well into the videography part. So yes, there's definitely a benefit to you. Uh, you'll get something out of this. So, all right. Well, let's uh, let's get right into this. So, first thing I want to talk about is uh, what makes a good image. Obviously, you can see that on the screen here. And of course, this is a very subjective. Uh, issue just because one you know what one person thinks is a good image doesn't necessarily mean that's what another person uh, thinks makes a good image however I think there's a pretty uh, relative universal here where we can say okay that's a great photo or this is not such a great photo um, but I think there's beauty also to be had in uh, in pretty much all images uh, to one degree or another however there's always a way to uh, to improve that so let's, uh, let's look at some of the images here. By the way, I did take all these images. I figure if, uh, if I'm gonna talk about this, I might as well at least prove I think I can take a, <laughs> take a good image. Um, so let's start here. So what, what makes a good image? Um, obviously light. The way light falls onto your subject, whether it be you know landscape, food, people, whatever it is, light is the absolute most critical thing. And without light, uh, without light, you can't really take a, you know, a picture. So let's take a look at some of the images here. You can obviously see how how light comes into play with uh, with some of these uh, some of these images. Um, again, beautiful sunset. We can see how the light is falling on the rocks and creating uh, you know highlights and shadows within the rocks. Here's another similar uh, type of sunset here bit of Photoshop work done, um, but uh, yeah, I like this image anyway. Um, here we go, this is uh, taken out in Western Australia uh, of all places, and uh, again, bright, colorful, um, lot, to, uh, lot to look at here. So, the first thing I wanna talk about is when you look at an image, your eye is drawn to three primary things. And this is very basic, uh, just to keep in the back of your mind, but uh, typically when you look at a photograph, this is what you see. So your eye is drawn to one, contrast, and that is the difference between, let's say black and white, or uh, lighter, uh, you know, light shades and darker shades, and the contrast helps bring the uh, uh, your subject out uh, so that your eye is drawn to it uh, more quickly. Second, things to, second thing to consider is, uh, of what your eye is drawn to are things that are in focus. So obviously we want everything or we want our subject matter or not, not always but a lot of times we'll want our subject matter in focus. So again we need to learn how to control uh, focus within an image. Uh, and it could be selective focus for whatever reason and whatever story that you're trying to tell. Very important. And the last thing that uh, your eye is drawn to, and you probably never think of this, it is the color red. And that has everything to do with the wavelength of the color red and how the light falls onto the actual uh, physicality of the rods and cones on your eyes. Uh, so again, a, a good uh, test uh, for this would be to, let's say, put a red object in your peripheral vision. Um, if, if, even if you're looking straight ahead, you'll always spot that red object in, you know, in the side of your eye. So uh, that just kind of illustrates an um, example of that. And let's see. Okay. 
So let's look at an example of contrast here. And I don't know what that was. Oh, my apologies here. So let's look at contrast. Example of contrast here. I used to shoot cars for uh, uh, several years. And this is, of course, one of the examples of that. So again, the contrast here, not necessarily a black and white, but we've got a darker shade of yellow against a brighter shade of yellow here. And of course, this, this black area uh, helps bring the car out. But if you stand from afar and you look right at this photograph, obviously your eye is going to be drawn straight to the, uh, to the yellow car. Here's another example of contrast. And again, I think this might be a better example where we've got the, the darker red background against the uh, silhouette of this uh, white hat. And of course, uh, this gentleman's face also kind of draws you in and his eyes. Eyes are very important when, uh, when shooting people. Here is, again, another example of contrast, um, which, by the way, black cars, black things are probably the hardest things to shoot just because a lot of your shadow detail tends to get lost in the darker areas, and yet you want to keep you know, a lot of the lines, at least in, when it comes to cars, you want to keep a lot of the lines uh, of the car in... Uh, well, you don't want to lose the, lose the line. So again, you know what helps too is you've got this nice highlight that's right on the top of this roll bar. Again, you're not really losing anything. It's because of that contrast of the dark background with the white that helps that pop out. So let's look at this next shot. This is a, a good example of focus. Now, this shot was taken with uh, something called a tilt shift lens. It's where you can actually uh, tilt the barrel of the lens so that uh, you can drastically alter the focus. And so my, uh, the purpose of this shot was I tried to get this to where all we really want to see of what's in focus is the expression on the, on the guy's face. So again, this is another example of a very shallow focus. This was taken with a Canon uh, 50 millimeter 1.2. And uh, obviously, we've got beautiful uh, blurred of the family here, but our, our eye, as soon as we see this, our eye is going to be drawn right to this, uh, to this girl and, of course, her, her cute expression. So, And again, again, this is just a very extreme example of uh, shallow, shallow focus. And uh, yeah, yeah, being an American, we got to look. Uh, yeah, everybody's got guns there. So anyway, um, yeah, just another example of focus. Your eye is drawn right to the barrel of the gun. Here's an example of red. Again, it's just it just pops. Uh, red is one of those colors that just uh, is very intense, and it, it just uh, it can pop right off of uh, off the screen, off of uh, off your image, off the off the uh, screen of the computer here. Here's another example of red here. Uh, actually, this is also a good example of a uh, shallow focus as well. Again, because this kid has a red bib on, your eye is drawn to it. He's got a smart look. You're looking right at his eyes. Um, I particularly like, like this shot. And then, of course, here is another example of red. And again, a shallow focus, uh, which also helps uh, emphasize the point of red. Your eye is immediately drawn to the uh, to the right hand side of the frame. And of course, this was uh, uh, <laughs> this was shot for a couple of friends of mine, uh, which I ended up making a Christmas card of. And so, of course, this was the text I put in there for, uh, for that. So I thought that was pretty cute. Moving on. So uh, I will always, always emphasize this where, um, sorry about that, that was the phone. I will always emphasize this to shoot in manual mode. I cannot uh, uh, emphasize this enough. I've had some of the most expensive cameras ever, and believe it or not, I still shoot in manual mode. And that is because sometimes what ends up happening, as good as the camera is, sometimes what will happen is the uh, camera won't see everything that really needs to be seen. And there are a couple uh, couple reasons for that. So I will always emphasize shooting in manual manual mode. So three pri three primary things to uh, control your exposure. One, of course, is your ISO or your film speed, as uh, as it was known. Uh, the second thing is your shutter speed, and your third is aperture. And we will get into those right here. So your ISO, also known as ASA. 
Uh, you can read this on your own. Just refers to back in the, the day, and of course you can get film now, but it refers to the film speed. And it, when it comes to digital cameras, it actually refers to the sensitivity of the sensor itself. So probably the most important thing to consider when you start adjusting your, uh, your ISO is that uh, as you go with a higher ISO, what ends up happening is you, your, the, uh, your shots become more grainy or there's more pixelating. Uh, and you start to lose some of the sharpness uh, of the image. Now granted, as cameras have gotten, uh, gotten better over the years, uh, we're able to start pushing the boundaries of your maximum uh, ISO. And of course, when you start introducing graininess uh, into the image, uh, that has also increased. Typically, I try not to shoot over 1200 or 1600 uh, ISO, but again, uh, you know, some of these newer cameras, the Sony's, the new cam some of the new Canon cameras that, that have come out have gotten very good at um, uh, eliminating uh, the graininess as you increase the sensitivity of the sensor. The next thing to consider is your shutter speed, and these are rated in fractions of a second, usually in one third uh, stops, and we're going to talk about what a stop is. So, uh, obviously, a faster shutter speed. Uh, let's less light through go through and of course this is referring to a DSLR and as you're getting more into these mirrorless cameras uh, It's there's no more shutter necessarily, but it still applies to this um, And of course a slower shutter speed will let more light through but of course it does other things to the image So I asked the question when would a slow a slower shutter speed be desirable? Well, let's look at an example here uh, the top left image here, this is an example of a slower shutter speed. Now this is where I was hanging out the side of a car. And what I wanted to do here is I wanted to depict some of the motion that was actually happening here, but yet I still wanted there, the shutter speed to be fast enough to uh, make the car very still. So obviously we're starting to see uh, motion blur within the ground here. We're seeing lo motion blur within the wheels. Uh, and yet the, uh, the silhouette of the car, the actual car itself is uh, still. So if I recall correctly, I shot this at 1 50th of a second. You can probably go down to 1 40th of a second. 1 30th is really starting to push it. Uh, and I just know that from experience. And then of course, um, here is a good example of a faster shutter here uh, in the bottom right corner. I shot this at one one thousandth, one thousandth of a second. And uh, you know, I wanted this girl just to be still. Obviously I caught her just as her foot was up here. In fact, uh, to be honest, I shot just a succession of, of uh, frames here. And this was the best one that I grabbed. Obviously we've got smiles going on here and some good action and we just happened to stop it right in that moment. So that's a good example of uh, faster shutter. For handheld, and this has to do with, again, shutter speed. Do not shoot at a shutter speed lower than the length of the lens that you are using. So I use the example of if you're going to shoot with a 200 millimeter lens, do not shoot slower than one two hundredth of a second if you're using a handheld you uh, doing a handheld shot. Now, of course, there's ways to get around that using a tripod or a monopod, or if your lens has uh, image stabilization, you can kind of uh, cheat with that a little bit, but this is just a general rule of thumb just to keep in the back of your mind. And of course, if you're gonna shoot with, let's say, a uh, 85 millimeter or a 50 millimeter lens, for example, uh, then you sh wouldn't shoot handheld slower than 1 50th of a second. Otherwise, what happens is you just um, run the risk of uh, introducing some motion blur or softness into your image. So, aperture. Let's talk about aperture. This is the f-stop of your optical system. And uh, you can read the technical uh, of this. I had to actually look that up in the dictionary to understand exactly what that is, but obviously it's a uh, focal ratio, an f-stop, f-ratio. So again, I just wanna dumb it down t for you, and this is probably the uh, most important thing to understand. Look, a higher f-stop 
number closes the iris down, letting less light through, where obviously more open will let more light through. But why is this important? Why do we even care about uh, this? This is the absolute most important aspect of your aperture is that the aperture controls your depth of field. So in other words, stopping down with a higher f-stop, less, letting less light in, it's going to increase your depth, whereas a lower f-stop number will give a shallower focus. And um, this gunshot is probably a very good example. If I recall correctly, I did shoot this with a 50 millimeter 1.2, and I shot this, I believe, at either a 1.2 or a 1.4. Uh, extremely, extremely shallow focus uh, with that, and this is this is very, very desirable. Um, a lot of, uh, let's say, modeling uh, photography, uh, you'll you'll see this where um, a lot of times where just the face will be uh, in focus, and by the time you get to the ears, um, they, they basically their their ears are out of focus. Um, so that's one aspect or one type of photography that where you might want a very uh, shallow focus. And of course you can check the, uh, there, there's an uh, f-stop check on, or a depth check button usually on the side of most cameras. And you'll have to, every camera's different, so you're gonna have to check this. But what it actually does is it will um, actuate the, uh, the uh, uh, aperture of the lens so that you can actually uh, check the depth on that, just in case you had uh, any questions about, okay, is your subject in focus? Of course, what will happen as a result too is what you're seeing through the uh, through the eyepiece gets darker. But again, that's just a, a side thing that happens when you when you go to check this. So. The thing to keep in mind and why we talked about your ISO, your shutter speed and apertures, you must understand that all these variables are interrelated in an effort to control light hitting the film or sensor. And most cameras are adjusted in one third stop increments or half stop increments. Um, in my experience, it's been one third stop, but you have some cameras now, you have the uh, ability to do it in half stops. Well, of course, that begs the question what is a stop? One full f stop essentially doubles the exposure or the amount of light let in. So, just to kind of reiterate this point, essentially what I'm saying is that if you were to, let's say, click your, uh, well, I think I do it on the next page here, yeah. Important aspect to understand is the correlation between these variables. Uh, in other words, so if you are going to adjust your, uh, let's say, shutter speed in one direction, you'll either have to adjust your ISO or your aperture in the other. So let's look at this for an example here. Let's say you've got some motion blur in your shots. How do you resolve this? Well, you're going to increase your shutter speed, but of course that's letting light, let less light in. So how would you compensate this? You're either going to use a lower f-stop or you're going to use a higher ISO. And if you understand the relationship between those two things, with a lower f-stop, of course, you're going to give a shallower depth. With a higher ISO, you're going to possibly introduce more noise into the image. So those are the trade-offs. Uh, let's say you've got another problem here. Your focus is too shallow. How do you figure? How do you fix that? Well, you then need a higher f-stop, compensate by a slower shutter speed or a higher ISO. And of course, if your image is too grainy, then you need to lower your ISO, and you compensate that by either slowing the shutter down or lower your f-stop. Or if that, and of course, this is for shooting uh, outdoors. If you're shooting with flash. Um, or if you can bring your uh, ambient light up, you know, if you're shooting inside, of course, bringing more light into the situation, again, because this is all about light, uh, introducing more light would also resolve this problem. This is probably the most important thing <laughs> that, uh, that I wanna talk about, or one of them, I wanna talk about with uh, digital cameras. Um, I see so many photographers checking the, the back of the camera without ever 
even understanding what a uh, what a histogram is or what an overexposure meter is. Uh, and then, of course, what happens is when you get to you know the post with uh, you know Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever you're using, and you realize, oh, I can't recover this photo. Well, you're you're done. You can't do that. You you've got to understand that the biggest difference between digital cameras and film cameras. When I was shooting a film, uh, let's say I overexposed, I had a little bit of uh, extra latitude to resolve the detail of that image. Whereas, you know, if you shoot with a digital camera, um, basically, you know, if, you, if you're having familiarity with Photoshop, you'd understand that uh, your RGB, your red, green, blue, your values, if all those values are pegged at 255 across the board, which is pure white, or if your values are pegged at uh, 000, 000 across the RGB, what ends up happening is you've, you've absolutely lost any and all detail in those shadow or highlight uh, areas and you will never ever be able to recover that. That's just, just how digital cameras work. So if you, if you learn to read your histogram versus just looking at the back of the screen, a lot of times the back of the screen can fool you because you can actually adjust the brightness of the back of the screen. So what you're seeing on the back of the screen may not necessarily be exactly what the sensor itself sees. And the histogram is just a quick way to judge your image and be able to make adjustments. So if you take a look at this, uh, this graph here, this is what a histogram actually is. And of course, your, your peaks and valleys are shown as, uh, your highlights are shown as peaks and valleys within your histogram. Obviously, your highlights would be on the right, your shadows on the left. And of course, the higher they are in that area, the more shadows or the more highlights there are. So let's take a look at the next slide here, because this is a good example uh, of this. So a normal histogram would be uh, like this one on the top here. And of course, this would be ideal. Uh, where we have everything kind of resolving uh, in the middle here. Overexposed, you can see this peak on the right hand side. This is just, you know, highlight detail that again, once it goes beyond here, you can never recover this. And the same goes for uh, underexposed uh, areas here where you've got peaks happening in the shadows. Now, I'll just touch on this very quickly here. Cameras with higher dynamic range, which means, uh, sensors that are more sensitive in the lighter and darker areas are, go are going to be able to capture uh, that detail. And as we, uh, as camera manufacturers push the, uh, push the sensors, push the cameras, you know, they're, they're actually getting very good at uh, being able to capture more and more details we go along. And I think that's where the future, uh, you know, of camera bodies is, uh, is going. So let's move on here. Color temperature. Okay, this is um, an adjustment that you can make on your digital camera. Uh, most film back in the day was daylight balanced, of course, unless you got uh, tungsten film. D uh, color temperature is rated in degrees of Kelvin, uh, with daylight falling around that, that 5200 to 5700 Kelvin mark. And of course, with digital cameras, a lot of times uh, you can fully control this. Hopefully you can, uh, some of the older cameras, you know, they give you kind of settings like outdoor or cloudy or auto white balance. Um, but in my opinion, uh, you are better off if that you can get this into the manual uh, Kelvin temperature where you can actually pick the temperature itself and shoot with it. Uh, I don't recommend shooting with auto white balance uh, generally, especially for video, because what ends up happening, look, it's, it's one thing to shoot with stills, uh, and I think you can kind of get away with that, um, but when it comes to video, what ends up happening, you know, you want consistency from the beginning of your video to the end of your video. And if you are in a situation where, let's say there is natural light that comes in and the cloud comes in, next thing you know, you have the, the, um, the auto white balance uh, adjusting for that. And that's just not good for video. Um, but again, 
uh, I don't recommend it with stills either, and that's just kind of my own rule of thumb. So again, why do I emphasize shooting in manual mode? And probably the most critical thing has to do with your, uh, the light meter that is internal within a camera. Um, when you shoot in manual mode, what you're, you know, look, photography is, you're playing the odds. You're trying to, you know, get the best shot possible. And how do you do that? Well, you do it through taking a lot of photos. Um, you know, that, that really is a big trick to taking a good photo is you just, you take a lot. Um, but if you master your technical, if you get the technical down, then what it comes down to is your composition. And if you're shooting people or situations, you know, you're, you're just capturing the moment. You don't have to worry about the, uh, the technical side of things. But in my experience, what I found is that um, sometimes when you start to trust the, uh, the, the light meter that is internal within a camera, sometimes uh, it's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. And it has everything to do with reflective versus ambient metering. Uh, reflective being, of course, just like what it sounds, reflection off of an object. Ambient is the actual light that goes uh, into or is, is shining in that moment. So um, I don't, obviously I can't show it to you right here what an ambient meter is, but if you've ever seen somebody kind of hold up this little meter up to someone's face, hit something on the side, that's what an ambient uh, meter is. And of course, it's just taking in all the light on your subject right there. Uh, whereas all cameras, all cameras internal exposure, uh, use reflective meters. Now, what they try and do is across the image, they try and take an average uh, of the, the, the luminosity of the image. And of course, um, you know, it, they're trying to adjust the exposure to bring everything to what they call a neutral gray. And of course, what is neutral gray, I ask? Uh, it is the in-between between black and white. And of course, uh, problems arise. And if you have any experience with photography, you'll realize this, that when you're shooting someone or anything that uh, is black or white, you know, uh, I, I love this when, when I've done portraiture and the family insists on shooting with, uh, let's say a white shirt with black pants. That is just a nightmare. And that will totally uh, trick your computer, or I'm sorry, not your computer, but your camera. Why? If you're shooting something uh, black, the camera is going to try and make that black, whatever subject is in there, black. They're trying to make it gray. Well, how does it do that? It does it by overexposing the image. And it will do just the opposite if you shoot something white. It's going to try and make the uh, a white object gray. Well, how does it make white gray? Well, it underexposes the object. So, um, you know, it's it, that's generally why I say unless you have an ambient, uh, you know, light meter on the side, and I still use an ambient meter to this day, even with digital cameras as good as they are. Um, look, I, I can't afford, uh, in my experience, to, you know, lose a shot. Um, sorry about the airplane. But uh, I, can't, I can't afford to lose the shot, and so that's why I use an ambient meter. That's why I shoot in manual mode. You know, just when you get the reaction out of the person you want and you shoot them, you're like, oh, that was a great shot. Well, if the camera didn't do the job right, then um, you're hosed and you just lost that shot and you're fired and you don't get paid. So that's that. Anyway, um, moving on. So one of the other things I also do too uh, that I would recommend, uh, I shoot all my photography in RAW. I do not shoot in JPEG. Um, some people shoot in JPEG, and personally, I just I just don't do it because I like to fiddle with my photos. And what ends up happening is, uh, when you shoot in JPEG mode, you burn in the camera data. So you, you basically, um, if you want to make any adjustments, whether it be with your color temperature or a camera profile setting, um, you. Basically, you can't adjust that uh, like you could if you shot in raw mode. Yes, there is more information. It takes up more storage space. But personally, I don't care because I want the best image that I possibly can get. So that is that. All right. 
So we are going into composition just again when we start talking about composition here I want to re uh, draw attention to the three things that your eyes are drawn to which is contrast, focus, and of course the color red. So with that in mind let's talk about composition. There are many things to consider of course with composition. Uh, rule of thirds, you've hopefully heard a little bit about this and what this is talking about is uh, how you compose your subject. I'll just read this negative space and quite si uh, negative space is quite simply the space that surrounds an object in an image. Just as important as the object itself, negative space helps to define the boundaries of positive space and brings balance to a composition. So I've got a square here, the square picture of a frame and of course I've divided it into three equal segments. Uh, let's look at this in relationship to a photo. So again, here we go. This is using the rule of thirds. Uh, again, we've got this wonderful negative space right here on the left hand side. And of course, this is great if you are doing any sort of advertising and we need a little bit of uh, copy space uh, in the side here. We want, you know, possibly a, a, a contrast area, a, a blurred out area is even better uh, in relationship to your subject. And of course, your eye is going to be drawn right to the image right here. That's not to say this is a, a rule and an absolute. Uh, but again, this is one form of doing composition uh, for an image. Natural framing. This is using uh, the natural framing of an image to help to, um, again, draw your eye in. I'll use the picture on the right as an example here. So of course, we've got this door behind this person. This, uh, this little girl is centered. That, that really helps um, you know, draw your eye to the middle. She's the only thing that's in focus. And of course, she is contrasty and a different color uh, to the background behind her. And of course, that's where your eye is drawn when looking at the image. Uh, looking at the middle picture right here, again, I don't, I can't show you this uh, just because I'm not there, but if we actually uh, got rid of the natural framing of this table right here, you know, you can kind of cheat this by putting your hand over uh, this video and blocking the, uh, the table below and you'd see that the image is, it wouldn't be as strong as if this table uh, were in there. Of course, um, what also helps too with is the table being blurred out. Using lines. This is a great way, great, great way to draw uh, someone's focus into the subject that you're, you're trying to see, or, she, see uh, or that you're trying to do. Obviously, um, with the railroad tracks, we've got some wonderful diagonal lines and your, li your eye is uh, going to follow those lines until we get to our subject here, which is in focus. And again, there's contrast. Uh, with again the red we're looking at this child what's he doing oh he's pointing of course we can clearly see that because he's in focus and of course the red helps one thing to even note about this photo too the, the photo um, on this this top right hand side or top left hand side it seems to fall apart here of course too because we're losing our contrast and yeah we, we we're just kind of losing here but again still works uh, for the photo Let's go to the other image here. We've got the lines of the road here blurred out, drawing your eye into the, uh, the subject uh, of the image. And yeah, it just, it just works because our draw, eye is drawn into what is in contrast here, black against the lighter background. So things to think about. Color combinations. Some color combinations work, some don't. Um, Again, this is just going to be an experimentation, but again, I'd, I'd use uh, contrast as kind of your, your rule of thumb here. Um, simplicity. If you've got a very busy background or a busy shirt on someone or, oh golly, uh, especially when I shoot people, I, you know, one of, the, one of the things I always say to people if I'm, if I'm going to shoot them is um, pick plain colors, plain, simple colors. No, uh, the worst thing is uh, t-shirts with writing on them. That's horrible because your eye is just going to get lost. It's just, it's drawn away from your subject um, with that. Uh, again, using objects for framing, symmetry, and lines to follow. And we just talked about all of this. So, How do you do this is the question. 
move. That is my biggest tip is uh, move around. Don't just stand in one place. Don't, uh, you know, always be standing. I mean, you know, the, those car shots. I'm literally laying on the ground with the camera itself propped on the ground to get that perspective. Um, get perspectives that nobody would think about. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've just kind of got to get out of the rut of, you know, sticking the camera in front of you. Maybe, you know, I've done things too where I've shot with a wide angle lens and I'll kind of hold it down low, uh, you know, towards my hip and start shooting up at people hoping I get the shot. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But, you know, it's again, it's a perspective of, uh, it's just a different perspective. And I can't emphasize that enough. Shoot down on people, shoot up at people, shoot, you know, all sorts of different ways. So, how many times have I heard this? <laughs> equipment, I wish I had better equipment because then I could shoot some amazing photos. Partly true. Um, equipment is only going to get you so far. And I got to tell you, I can take, um, where can I go with this? Good, well, let me just read it. Good equipment does not always equal a good photo. And my recommendation is that if you're going to spend any money on good equipment, spend it on the lenses. I've got a couple of lenses that are literally 15 to 20 years old. I still use them to this day because they were the best lenses I could get at the time. And they're still incredible. And I've done this experiment before where I've taken uh, really good lenses and put them on you know, the cheapest body that you can get. And I will take better photos with that combination than I would the most expensive body that you have and a garbage lens. It's, it's just that simple. But again, it still comes down to light. There's an art to this and take lots of photos. So let's talk about the different uh, kinds of things, and especially if you're watching this from Lifehouse Church or any other church for that matter, um, or you like taking people pictures. Um, I'll just tell this, you know, from from experience. Shooting people is, in my experience, I think one of the hardest kinds of photography, and that's just because you're trying to capture a moment in time. People move. People, oh my gosh, people just don't know how to smile. That is, boy, that's that's something uh, that's really hard to overcome. And of course, if you st most people, if you stick a camera right in front of them you're going to get the most awkward smile, the most awkward look, and it's just going to be horrible. Um, not many people can are very photogenic, and there's definitely an art and a trick uh, to it. So some of the things that, I, that I've done myself to fix this, of course, shoot with a longer lens so that you don't, they, you know, they don't know that you're there. You know, you're basically a fly on the wall capturing the moment. Uh, a lot of times, in fact, I just did this last week on a shoot where um, people were getting stiff or people were kind of, you know, they were trying to smile, but it was so uh, so animated and so unreal. A lot of times I will tell a joke uh, or just be goofy or just do something, just do anything I can just to kind of uh, get them, you know, my subject to forget that they've got a camera in front of their face. Um, so also being personable, don't be too demanding, be, you know, you can compliment people. Um, you know, I think of Austin Powers, you know, that's great, baby. Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend, uh, you know, shooting that way, but, uh, anything you can do to compliment someone. It's funny too, because, you know, you may connect with them and in what you say may, may resonate with someone. And then of course, then you get that natural smile. Um, so that helps. And just, Putting people at ease, um, that's that's so important. And of course, uh, another thing to do is work with professional models. A lot of professionals know how to smile. Uh, they just know how to just flip a switch and turn it on. You may not have that luxury, but even at that time, believe it or not, um, with professionals, doing all of the above, telling the jokes and being personable goes a long, long, long way. But again, I always emphasize this. If you do not have your technical down, you may lose the reaction, you may lose the opportunity, and you may lose the shot. Um, so I can't emphasize that enough. So that's it. Hopefully uh, all this helped. And uh, yeah, that's my presentation. And stay tuned for the video presentation.